if we insert the functional forms of a of omega and b of omega into f of t, we will get this particular expression at the bottom of your screen. It's important that we look and evaluate or examine each of the terms. We still, of course, have the constant 1 over pi out front, as I mentioned a moment ago. We have the integral going from 0 to infinity, still. The infinite integral here has come from the definitions of a of omega and b of omega. And I've simply put all of their bits and pieces together and have called all of this expression number 1. Note, by the way, that expression 1 is being integrated with respect to r in this now double integral. However, its result is being integrated with respect to omega. So we are going from something which is a function of omega to something which is a function of t. Because as I said numerous times now, we are integrating out the omega dependence. The next step we must do is utilize a clever trigonometric identity. We note that we have the product of two cosines added to the product of two sines. This may be rewritten as nothing else but the cosine of a minus b, where a in this case is omega times r and b is omega times t. Furthermore, cosine, which we're now left with, is an even function, satisfying the following relationship. What this means is that I can actually change the order in the cosine. A moment ago I said that a con corresponded to omega r and b corresponded to omega t. Well, because cosine is an even function, I can swap that and say that a is going to be omega times t and b is going to be omega times r. What this means is that equation 1 can be rewritten as cosine omega t minus omega r. Or we can now rewrite the entire equation. We still have 1 over pi, the 0 to infinity integral, and we are still integrating with respect to omega. But the expression in the middle can be rewritten as a function of r multiplied by cosine omega t minus omega r, which of course we integrate with respect to r. I'm going to call the expression in the middle with the infinite integral expression number 2. The next thing we can notice is that cosine is an even function. In this case we are integrating it with respect to omega at the very least. This means that we can replace the 0 to infinity integral by one half of the infinite integral. This results in the equation written on the bottom of your screen. Note by the way, now we have a 1 over 2 pi outside on the front, and I'm sure that's something you've seen in the past and often wondered where it came from. The pi is a legacy issue from the Fourier series, and the half comes from changing the integral to an infinite or fully infinite integral. The next thing for us to do is a bit of a sleight of hand. Let's consider this particular integral where we had a, a sine rather than a cosine. So let's pretend that in fact this here was sine. Now sine is an odd function and in this case it's an odd function of omega and therefore, in the integral, it will integrate to zero. So let's repeat this, because it's quite a subtle step. Because in this particular expression here, cosine is an even function of omega, we were able to replace the integral going from zero to infinity by half of the, the corresponding infinite integral. And also, because sine is an odd function of omega, let's say if we had sine here, it will integrate to zero, or it would integrate to zero. An odd function of omega would integrate to zero. 
So the sleight of hand we're going to do is we're going to include a sign term anyway in this particular expression and invoke Euler's formula. So we had the cosine which we started with, multiply it, or excuse me, add it by i times the sine of the corresponding argument. Thereafter we convert this to a complex exponential and hopefully now you can see why it's important to use the dummy variable. So finally what we're left with is the following expression. We start with a function of t, small f of t. That's equivalent to having 1 over 2 pi, the double infinite integral, and we have our input function again, but this time we use the dummy variable r. We multiply it by e to, the my, e to the i omega t minus r, and we integrate it dr d omega. Of course, if we never used the dummy variable in the first place and we always had t, then we would never have come to such an expression. I'm sure you can see what's going to happen next. We're able to split this exponential into a positive and negative exponential. What you're looking at here is known as the complex Fourier integral. I'm not going to discuss the concept of a transform here because I think it will confuse the issue. This is something we will discuss at greater length when we fully derive the transform proper.